and actually we're also um, up in the Okay, okay. Yeah. So I think you have a lot of okay. Yeah, I mean, we lived in Ogdensburg, so job-wise. Yeah, I don't think there's anything there. <laughs> <laughs> just leave it at this. Yeah. There is a church there, but it's, it's got issues that it starts to work out. Yeah. There are a lot of churches that are, are struggling right now because they've allowed certain sins and certain things somewhere. I know uh, the older had uh, Brother Overton, the former pastor. Yes. He's down trying to fix some stuff in Norway. Right. He's uh, there without a pastor. Yeah. Mm -hmm. your hymnals and let's go to 264 it's all about him that's why we got a hymnal all about him amen it's good to be saved amen come on Brent tell me it's great to be saved amen <laughs> 264 yes at the cross all right come on. all right at last and my Savior bleed and did my sovereign
friend of mine, best friend. He's a military guy, uh, retired military, so you can't hurt his feelings. Amen. 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 Yes. <laughs> he was my workout partner, and uh, he got skinny and I stayed fat. <laughs> Amen. Come on up, brother. Amen. It's good to be saved. Come on, come on. Thank you. Amen. 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 Glad to be here. Amen. Thank you, Pastor. Hoorah. And, uh, you know, it's, it's, believe it or not, in the ministry, truly, truly good, close friends are hard to come by. Uh, most people in the ministry, as soon as you go through a problem or you struggle a little bit, they kind of head for the hills because they don't want to be criticized for being your friend. And, uh, your pastor is not one of those people. Yeah. I'm very thankful yeah, for that. You know, yeah, he, he's stuck with me through things and, and has helped guide me. And, Amen. and I appreciate it a lot. Hopefully, I got enough printed out here. Just enough to only skip the pastor and my daughter. Oh, is that a kid book here? Oh, there you go. We'll share it. Oh, you'll share it? Okay, so your pastor can help Okay. You've already heard. So. <laughs> if she needs one, me and her can share. No, she doesn't need one. Okay. Uh, so, for those of you that don't know me, because there is some new people here, which is is good. Amen. It's uh, good to be here and not have everybody aware of who I am. Uh, I'm <laughs> Brother Corey Chartier. I'm a missionary to India. Uh, I was stationed at Fort Drum and. Uh, the Lord impressed upon my heart while I was at Fort Drum to become a missionary. I'll share a little bit more about that calling uh, when it comes to the, the uh, main uh, message. You know, and uh, I'll share a little bit about what's going on over there, too. Uh, for Sunday school, we're going to be in uh, 2 Corinthians chapter 8. And uh, I want to talk about missions giving. And I know this is one of those hard topics, you know, and nobody... Nobody that I know that preaches really enjoys <laughs> preaching on giving. Yeah. Amen. That's because, right. Because, That's right. Because there's always at least one person in the crowd, the first thing that hits, hits their head is, is, well, he's just preaching about this because he wants my money. No. I, I, don't, I don't want your money, and you don't have any money. Right. Come on. God has money. That's right. Amen. Amen. That money belongs to God. God's going to press upon you what you need to do with that money. Yep. Whether or not you obey him, that's up to you. That's right. Uh, you know, uh, it's giving is is a biblical principle. Uh, I I don't have it in this uh, lesson, but one thing I always like to start off. Uh, I was moving over two Bibles. You said Second Corinthians chapter six. Uh, chapter eight. Chapter eight. Thank you. Sorry about that. Yeah, that's okay. Uh, one thing I like to start off uh, clarifying on here: we're not talking about tithe. In, the, in this lesson, I'm not talking about your general offering to your church. This is about giving for missions. I know. Amen. Amen. You know, th those things are separate. Yeah. And we, we have to understand that, that we have obligations to all three. And for those of you that may be under the impression that you don't have an obligation to tithe, the tithe started at Abraham. And there's no place that it's ever removed. It's, it's, it's there the whole way. You know, the first instance... Is Abraham with Melchizedek? It's not part of the Levitical priesthood. It, it's it's there from the beginning. So we need to understand those things. Now uh, I'm going to go ahead and open in prayer, and then I'll, I'll read a little bit, and we'll get started. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this opportunity to share your word. Lord, I thank you for these people that are here to hear your word. Lord, please help us to have a uh, 
prepared heart and prepared mind, let your spirit do a work in each and every one of us. We know we can do nothing without you, Lord. Just guide us and direct us in this time. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So 2 Corinthians chapter 8. This uh, Paul's call to, upon Corinth to give onto the needs of others. Uh, you must remember this book was written to Corinth by Paul to preserve the, the, the uh, work of God and the people there and encourage them. Uh, so often when we read the epistles, we forget there are two specific churches. That's why it says church, right. because he's talking to that church. <coughs> That's right. It's a local place. And we always want to apply it in some, well, we don't, but some people want to apply it in this mystical manner. No, this was written to, a, to, to the church. Now, that doesn't mean we can't get instruction for it. The instruction does carry over, but it was written to a people that were having a struggle. And uh, there in chapter 8, verse, starting in verse 1 it says, through 3, it says, Moreover, brethren, we do you to wit of the grace of God bestowed on the churches of Macedonia, how that in a great trial of affliction... The abundance of their joy and their deep poverty abounded unto the riches of their liberality. For to their power I hear record, yea, and beyond their power, they were willing of themselves. There in that first uh, blank, missions giving is not of your abundance, but you must give yourself completely. They gave above because they were giving of themselves. You know, uh, in Romans it says that that's a, that's our uh, that's our 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 due service is to give all of ourselves. That that's what we're supposed to do. They gave beyond their ability to give. The giving of the people of Macedonia was <coughs> supernatural. They gave even though they themselves were in a rough state. You know, uh, to tell you the truth, I've only gone to a few big churches. I'm not really a big church guy, but uh, so. If they invite me, I will go there and speak, but I'm not, I'm not trying to get into big churches. Right. Uh, but they're really not as giving. The most giving churches I've ever been around are all church plants. Mm-hmm. You know, I went down to uh, Virginia to visit a, a church plant uh, a few years back, and, I mean, they gave us a, a – they, they put us up in a hotel room and – Gave us a nice basket and gave us a very, a very good love offering and just loved on us and it was, it was great. But then you go into some of these big churches and you speak and and they they barely speak back to you. Mm-hmm. The end of the end of the service, everybody walks out the door. Mm-hmm. <laughs> like they never met in the first place. Yeah, the yeah. The like, you know, and you're like, did I say something wrong? You know, you're trying to figure everything <laughs> yeah. out. You know, uh, and. And there's just no, there's no feeling there and no love. Right. You know, because the, the money isn't what's important, but it, but it does represent how people love. That's why it's called the love offering. Mm -hmm. It shows the the willingness to give. That's right. You give to things you care about. You know, you, you, you spend money on your children because you love them, you know, and for everybody that, that, that's different. We all have different economical backgrounds, you know, but I, I don't know personally any parents that would would sit there and eat if they didn't have the money to get their kids something. Right. They would feed their kid before them. If they if they had a choice, I can eat or they can eat. The kid's gonna eat. Right. Come on. You know. No. And and that's love. Uh, <clears throat> there in verse starting in, in verse four it says, praying us with much entreaty that we would receive the gift and take upon us the fellowship of the ministering to the saints. And this they did not as we hoped. But first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God, insomuch that we desired Titus, that as he had begun, so he would also finish in you the same grace also. We're on point two now. They prayed and spent time with them talking of the need. You know, uh, so often I've heard churches, I've talked to pastors and and, uh, been in a church where I was talking to my pastor and they're upset because they don't feel people are giving enough, but they never let them know of the need. Mm. If people don't know there's a need, how are they supposed to know they need to give? Amen. You know, we have, we have to share that need with the people, you know, and they were hoping they would learn from them the desire to help those that are afflicted. 
You see, we, those, those blanks there are need and learn and desire. Hoping they would learn from them the desire to help those afflicted. If we don't show any desire ourselves to help those that are afflicted, how are our people supposed to learn? Right. You know, some Baptist churches are very cold. Hmm. You know, I mean, I know me and your pastor both at times can be rough spoken, but neither one of us is cold. If someone needs help, we're going to help them. Amen. We're going to stand for people. We're going to we're going to be there. Amen. Now, help doesn't always look like you want it to look. Yeah, come on. Just just to clarify, it's there's right been right. times where I, I've talked to people, and I actually had a fellow uh, preacher one time ask, look at me after I got done speaking to a guy right outside my church. He looked at me. He was a guest guest speaker, and he said, "You talk to people like that." I'm like, it's what he needed. Right, amen. I wasn't giving him something he didn't need. I know his background. You know, I decide, I was trying to disciple the guy and work with the guy. I knew his background, so I knew if I didn't just plainly speak, hey, you're messing up. You're the head of your household. Take charge. That he right. wouldn't do it. Amen. amen. So sometimes we have to show that desire for people to our people and show them that there's a need. And it goes on here in uh, verses 7 through 9 and says, Therefore, as ye abound in everything, in faith and utterance and knowledge, and in all diligence, and in your love to us, see that you abound in this, grace also. I speak not by commandment, but by occasion of the forwardness of others, and to prove <coughs> the sincerity of your love. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. Amen. I think too often we don't think of what Jesus gave up. We, we don't truly examine what our Savior did for us. Uh, for, for a moment here, just turn to uh, Philippians chapter 2. And we'll get right back into the primary. But Philippians chapter 2, verses 5 through 8. Let this mind be in... In you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant, and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. We worship a God that died for us. He had everything. That's right. Come on. You know, most Americans won't leave, won't leave a warm living room to go do something. Yeah, come on. Yeah. But Christ left heaven. Yep. To come and deal with the daily suffering of being in a human body. Mm. And not only then, he didn't make himself the son of, you know, Herod or the son of, you know, some king or prince. He was the son of a carpenter. Right. Yeah. Come on. Now, in, in that society at that time, carpenter didn't just mean cabinet maker or making chairs. It meant doing construction. Mm -hmm. And in the Middle East still to this day, and clear through most of Asia, if you're the son of someone that does construction, guess what you're doing your whole life? Construction. Yeah. Construction. <laughs> you're, you're, you know, when at a young age, you're moving piles of dirt from one place to another and, and, and mixing it together to make bricks and... You know all those type of things. You're you're building with wood. You're building with all these different things. So he he was he wasn't this little weak man that looked like he was a lost member of the Bee Gees that people make <laughs> make their Jesus in America. Right? Come on. Amen. He was a man that was hard from work. He wasn't weak and soft. Come on. Amen. But he had love for people enough that he left heaven, lived that life, and then died on the cross for yes, your sir. sins. That's right. You know, and we lose sight of that so often, how much our, our Lord and Savior gave up for us. And then when we're asked to give, we're like, well, he's just trying to, he's just trying to get me to give to that church because he wants my money. <laughs> I mean, I, I've heard it my whole family, right? Any, I mean, I, I'm not from a, a good Baptist family. Here in Washington, if, if they go, if they visit a church and somebody mentions money, that, that's all you'll hear the, the whole rest of the day. Yeah, come on. But it's God's money. That's right. Amen. You need to do with it what God puts in your heart to do. <coughs> you need to let Him do the work in you. 
giving is an act of love. Is that that blank that blank there? You know, uh, if you're if you're not willing to put money towards it, then you don't love it. Yeah, how about it? How much do you love your church? Come on. I know, I mean, everyone has different economic backgrounds, but I'm pretty sure everybody here has bought a soda this week, or in my case, a seltzer. But, you know, you love, you, you love yourself enough to buy yourself a gift of a drink you don't need. But you don't love your church enough to, to give to your church. Come on. You don't love the missionary, the, the people of India enough to give to missions. Come on, that's right. You don't love the people enough in Puerto Rico to give to missions. You know, I don't know what all missionaries and stuff have came through. I know two, me and me and the Bahamas. Uh, but uh, <laughs> but you know the you know you you have to be you have to give out of love to prove right. we truly love. We have to give. Is that second blank there in point three? Because of Christ's grace, He became poor for us. You know, we will never, ever be able to give up. Even in the act of just coming to earth, we will never be able to give up as much as Christ gave. Just in that act. Not counting dying on the right. cross. Come on. So often we only focus on the cross, which is, I mean, it's wonderful. That's, that's, he saved us. But how much had he already given even before he went to the yeah. cross? We're not even, we're not even anywhere near that. We own our lives. We should spend our lives yeah. trying to get it back. Yep, that's 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 our that's, I mean the Bible. That's what the Bible says. That's yeah. that's our just, that's yeah. just giving. Amen. Is to give all of yourself. True grace giving not only comes by surrendering finances, but surrendering ourselves to the will of God. Amen. Jesus Christ gave not only His life, but surrendered to become flesh and live as one of us <coughs> when He was King and God. You know. This is a struggle. I'm not saying it's easy. Because you still have flesh. Even if you're saved. Your flesh is still there. You know. I'm not saying I'm never tempted. You know. Uh, I'm, I'm sure your pastor at times has been tempted with different things. Because there are easier jobs than me and the pastor here in Governor. Right. <clears throat> Come on. I, I mean. Come on. There's not more fulfilling jobs for him. Right. He wouldn't be happy anywhere else. But. There are easier jobs. And there's yeah. days in the ministry where you look around and you're, you're like, especially when someone attacks your wife, which happens. That, I don't know anybody in the ministry, ministry that's never had anyone attack their wife. Right. Come on. I wasn't in the ministry a, a minute and my yeah. wife was attacked. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> so it, it, it's just part of the ministry. And as a man, that's hard. You know, I mean... Not operating with, with uh, the Spirit, it's impossible mm -hmm. for me. I'm not saying for every man. I know not all men are built that way. But if I was still in my flesh and somebody attacked, attacked my wife, they'd be picking up their teeth. Amen. Yeah, come on. But I have to let the Spirit take control. Mm -hmm. i got to represent Christ. i got to suffer that. And then, and then plead with my wife and get her to understand why we have to suffer that. Yeah, come on. Amen. You know, so, that, so there's, there's, a, there's a giving there. In the ministry, and in that economy, you're not given to nothing. These people are these people are 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 sacrificing themselves to do the work. You know, uh, in missions giving, like with with what we're doing over there, we have a missionary that goes to Bangladesh. Uh, he's currently staying with us and and learning some more on ministry. But when he left Bangladesh the first time after planting a church, it was because people were going to kill him. He's part of the Chakma tribal group. Uh, he's my son by adoption. <coughs> not legal adoption, but by adoption, Robin Chakma. And, uh, you know, he, he was born Buddhist. And when he converted, his family abandoned him. His dad was a witch doctor. Mm -hmm. He was supposed to take that title when his dad died. Last time he returned to Bangladesh, his mother gave his sister the paperwork to officially make him an orphan legally through the government. Mm. That's how much it meant to his family to make sure that he knew that he was no longer one of them. Wow. You know, these, these missionaries, these people that, that we help over there, they're giving a lot. 
You know, it's no light thing when you come from these backgrounds to accept Christ. Right. Amen. You know, we're all going to suffer for Christ, but on, on in their cases, that suffering comes much quicker and much more apparent. Uh, <clears throat> starting in verse, uh, trying to get back to where I was. Uh, <clears throat> Ten. It says, and herein I give my advice, for this is expedient for you, who have begun before, not only to do, but also to be forward a year ago. Now therefore perform the doing of it, that it, as there was a readiness to will, so there may be a performance also out of that which ye have. For if there be <coughs> first a willingness, uh, a willing mind, it is accepted according to that a man hath, and not according to that he hath not. For I mean not that other men be eased and ye burdened, but be an equality that now at this time your abundance may be a supply for their want, that their abundance also may be a supply for your want, that there may be equality. As it is written, he that hath gathered much had nothing over, and he that hath gathered little had no lack. Once you have begun to follow God, there must be a doing of it. That's those first two blanks there on point four. Begun to follow and a doing of it. We do not take this action as a burden. So often in my past, I didn't get my heart right before I gave. Yeah, come on. I was one of those people that, well, I put on that missions card that I was going to give. So, here you go. Yeah, come on. Kind of the... I don't know if anybody here pays attention to Winnie the Pooh when they were a kid or whatever, but I was kind of the Eeyore of Given. Right. Well, I guess. Right, come on. That's I'll cool. suffer for Christ. <laughs> come on. I mean, so often that's how it is, you know. And But we have to, we have to do it not as a burden. The burden right. is Christ's. There's no burden for us unless we're doing it in our flesh. We have to get in the Spirit every day of our lives. When you wake up in the morning, if you're not starting out with prayer and reading your Bible, you're already wrong. You're going to get attacked that day and you're going to fall right away. Because mm -hmm. you can't do it in your flesh. You have to be strengthening the Spirit. But because we want to live in God's economy. Now this is very interesting. When I, when I was reading this the first time and I was thinking about this and, and researching it, it's interesting to me there... How he says, you know, that they'll give back. Right. What do you receive back from India? You know, as as people, we always think physical. Mm -hmm. We're like, well, nobody in India is sending us money. You're right. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have any money to send you. <laughs> Come on. But you know what? They can pray. Yep. You know, uh, it's something I've had to learn to adjust to. Because if you ask, especially a Nepali woman that's saved to pray at the end of a service, mm -hmm. you better not be hungry. Yeah. It's going to be a while. Yeah. They can pray. And they pray for it. Amen. We make a point at our church to, from the, from the very first week we got there, Governor Bible Baptist and Seneca Bible Baptist were on that prayer list. They pray for you. Amen. 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 You know, when your pastor shared for me a desire to reach more of the Amish, I shared that desire with them. Amen. Even though most of them don't have any clue what an Amish is. <laughs> <laughs> but they know, they know they want to be reached, so, you know, they pray for it. And that, you know, that's the economy. Right. Amen. You know, they, they receive help from the U.S., <coughs> you know, from the churches here, and they pray for these churches. I think sometimes in missions, maybe that's not the economy, and we're missing that. There's an obligation of the missionary to ensure that our our fellow Christians where we're working are lifting you up in their prayers. Because how are you supposed to stay strong? Right, come on. You know, we always talk about the missionary needing prayer. You know, and that's part of giving. If you're giving, you're going to remember to pray. Yes, sir. But... That those prayer we need to be we need to be returning prayers because it's not easy here. I've I've knocked doors here. I know it's not easy. 
there's very few people here that want to talk to you. Yeah. yeah. How about it? And it doesn't matter what town you're in in northern New York. Yeah, how about it? Yeah. yeah, they're not trying to kill you, but they're like, why is this, you know, the only time I've had good work, good, good luck is I fought when I follow the Jehovah Witnesses. And they're happy I'm not one of them. Right. <laughs> Come on. You know, uh, but, you know, we have to realize it's God's economy. You know, we're not health and wealth prosperity gospel here. That's we're right. not saying you're going to be rich because you gave the mission. Yeah, hallelujah. Fight physically. But you're going to be rich because people are praying for you. Yes, sir. You're going to be rich because you're, you're honoring God. And when you get to heaven, there's a reward for that. Mm, but we, we need to understand God's economy. Paul is not asking them to give to burden them, but to bless those that are being given to. And in return, they bless them back. When you give to missions, you receive a part of all the success of that giving. We had about two and a half weeks before I left, we had five people saved Amen. Amen. at our discipleship amongst the deaf tailoring class. Amen. Amen. Praise God. That's Amen. part of your reward. Amen. Amen. Those people wouldn't have got saved because there's things that have changed in the ministry just because me and Pastor Ben were working together. Yes, he's much better at sign language and certain things, but there were certain things he just financially couldn't do and he didn't have the connections to do. He, he knew that there was good discipleship material out there, but he couldn't find anybody willing to work with just him. I started making some, some phone calls and, and got a hold of some good materials from uh, my sending church and got permission from the guy that created them to reproduce them in India. Amen. And we started discipling them. And because of that, they actually started receiving truly the word of God. Amen. Uh, other than Pastor Bimmel in India, the, the primary thought when it comes to the deaf is you only teach to them in son. Mm. They had never memorized a Bible verse. Because the deaf don't need to read, according to the Indian mentality. Mm. So, first week we assigned a, a memorization verse, and all of them that can physically write when they showed up for the next class, wrote out that verse. And they loved it. They were so happy and so 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 just, you know, ecstatic to have done something that they knew pleased the Lord. Even though most of them aren't even saved. Mm -hmm. they, they knew it's the right thing to do and, and they're learning. And well now most of them are saved. Amen. Because five is the majority of the class. Mm -hmm. uh, and we had two baptisms the week the week I left, we had two baptisms. Amen. And, you know, it's it's just a wonderful thing to see what, what you're giving is producing. Yeah. Because you have to have finances. Ministry can't happen without finances of some some sort. You know, there's, you know, tracks and, and education and, and getting them to come. The sewing ministry... I know that's different than what you would see in America, right? You know, you're not teaching people here to sew throughout the week. But it was a way to get the deaf to see how much we care. Is there Most places will charge them to learn how to sew. And then once they're proficient enough, they'll pay them. We just teach them, and whatever they produce, they get paid for. And most of the time, oh, I forgot to bring that in. Uh, most of the time, we don't even, you know, necessarily always get the things sold. But we, we want them to understand the importance of their work and, and to keep them coming there to learn the Bible. Because we every morning, every day, there's discipleship. Amen. You know, and, and that is what you're giving to. I'm going to share uh, some statistics real quick and, and give you an idea of, of just when I looked these up, it kind of pained me. And I understand these statistics don't represent us as Baptists, I hope. Right, that, that when you look up statistics on the internet, most of the time it's it's an ecumenical right. statistic. On. I hope as Baptists we're doing better than the average. Amen. Amen. Uh, America has gave forty five billion to missions in two thousand fourteen. The same amount we spent dieting. Mm. Think about that. It's the same importance level to the American people. The people get saved in foreign nations as it is to lose weight 
An average price per cell phone in a home is $45 a month. The average amount a, a, a missionary receives from a church is $50 a month. So, you know, just speaking of a church, you know, that, that I know well, the church that I was in most of the time I was here, you know, we were mostly a middle class church. Right. Uh, almost all military. Uh, basically, every kid there over the age of 12 had a cell phone. Mm -hmm. uh, every parent had a cell phone. So you're talking in a church of 124 people, probably 60, 70 cell phones. And seven missionaries on the wall. Mm -hmm. <laughs> when I, I mean, when I looked that up, it, it, it hit me because I have five kids, and at that time, none of my kids were married yet. So I was paying for actually eight cell phones because my I was paying for my mom's too. I'm not going to share what my bill was. You, you you won't you won't believe it. Uh, <laughs> but but it was it was more than I gave to missions in a month. That's for sure. Mm -hmm. And that and that. That struck me. That it shouldn't be that way. We shouldn't be, you know, our cell phone bill in a in a in a month shouldn't be more than our missions giving in a year. Right. Come on. Amen. You know, we we, we need to pay attention to what God would have us do. Uh, out of the amount given, it is estimated that only four hundred fifty million went to unreached people. Now, I even have a problem with the term unreached people. Mm. <coughs> Tell you the truth, the majority of people in India, I do not consider unreached. Even if it says 0%. Because the gospel was delivered. Just because you deny the gospel doesn't mean you were unreached. Right. Yeah. Am I right? Now, there are still unreached people in India. Most of them are in the mountains. And nobody's going there because nobody wants to walk for five hours to talk to three people. That's the unreached people. Mm -hmm. We're still concentrating on all these people that live in cities and all these different areas. What One of our goals is to get missionaries into these rural, hard-to-get-to areas so that they can truly speak to people that are unreached, not people that received the gospel in 54 AD and denied it. Mm -hmm. Because there was Christian settlements in India before the British got there. Yeah. You know, I'm not taking away from what William Carey did. I think he did great work for the Lord. Yeah. But we have to realize there is a difference between unreached and refused. Right. Yes. In America, we have a lot of a lot of neighborhoods that are refusing the gospel. Yeah. Amen. Yes. There's. I know there's people going out there trying to reach those houses. Some of those houses are just refusing. I'm not saying to, to stop preaching, stop teaching, but we have to understand that. There, there comes a point. I remember there was one couple I was trying to reach for a long time. And uh, my old pastor, one day me and him were talking, he said, you know, at some point you have to realize that some people just refuse. Yep. That's why the Bible tells you to shake the dust off. Yeah, amen. You know, it's hard. It, it, for me, that, it's just hard to imagine. Why would you refuse? Right. Why would you not want Christ? But we have to understand these things. Christians make up 33% of the world, but we receive 53% of the world's wealth. Now, like I said, that's an ecumenical statistic. I know Baptists, that's not always it. But we need to do better. We need to give to missions. We need to understand it's our responsibility, to, and that's the only way we will please the Lord. So I'm just going to ask you one last question, and I'll close in prayer. What can you give up to send the word of Jesus Christ to these people? Mm -hmm. Maybe it's you buy five Mountain Dews a week and you're going to go down to three. I don't know. I don't know everybody's financial situation or whatever. But there's something everybody can give up to do more. Mm -hmm. You know, and I, have, I examine myself frequently and say, you know what? You can give this up. You don't need this. Because sometimes I lose track. And sometimes I need reminders for right. people. Come on. So I'm not doing this in a, in a mean way. I'm not trying to hurt anyone's feelings. But we need to ask what we can give up to help mission. Let's pray. Dear Lord, I just pray that 
you would just uh, use this message to speak to people's hearts, Lord. That we would examine ourselves and say, what can we do, what can we give up to ensure that your gospel is going throughout the world? Lord, I know that you would have each and every one of us give something. Please help each and every one of us to give what you desire, not out of the desires of our flesh. Please help us to put the burden on you and walk in the Spirit in our missions giving. Please help us to give fully ourselves over to you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Just give me a few seconds. Um, because I don't know, we, have good, we have visitors here today, so uh, um, just give me a few seconds now. The Bible says that Christ died for our sins, right? Okay, he was buried. He rose again the third day. We all agree that? Amen. Okay. Uh, is there anybody here? You know, you don't, uh, there's a word going out. It's called being saved. People are talking about being born again and being saved, but most people don't understand what uh, that is. What is being saved? What is being born again? Uh, just give me a few seconds. Uh, the Bible, the gospel is just that Christ died for our sins. I was all talking to an Amish guy, and I said, could you tell me why Christ died? He said, so we can do good things. I said, well, that isn't why he died. He, died. he didn't die for you to do good things. You could have done good things before he died. Yep. That's true. That's true. So he didn't die for you to do good deeds and do good things, and you're not going to get get to heaven on your good deeds and your good things. Why? He didn't die for that. Amen. He died for, for the things you, you you fell short on, the sins that you committed. Amen. We're all liars. How many people here have lied in their life? That's me. I'm a liar. Right? right? You're a liar. Have stolen something. Even didn't even know you, you took candy or something you shouldn't have done. Or we're thieves. Right? Come on. These are sins. That's why Christ died. He died so, so that you could get a relationship with Him. We're not about a religion. Okay? Uh, look, you got to understand something. I'm a Bible believer who pastors a Baptist church. Right. Okay? I'm not worried about being Baptist. Amen. To tell you the truth, most of the things a Baptist say I'm not happy with. Right. Okay? I'm, but I'm happy with the things the Bible says. Amen. Amen. Come on. Yes. Preach it. And the Bible says that Christ died for our sins, and you need to be born again. Why do you need to be born again? So you can you can go to this place that's called heaven, but you got to be in Christ. I'm not selling you real estate. I'm not trying to get you into heaven. What I want you to get is to know Christ and be with Christ. The wages of your sin is death. It's personal. Amen. Not just the wages of sin. Your sin. Amen. Your sin is death. But the gift of God is eternal life yes, sir. through Jesus Christ. Yes, sir. Okay? Now, if you've never been born again or you've never been saved, why don't you make today the day? Yes, sir. Amen. Why don't you make today the day? How easy is that? Well, look at the thief on the cross. Lord, remember me. Yes, sir. It's about your heart by faith receiving Christ. It's not about what you can do. It's about what Jesus yes. did for you. Amen. Dying for you. If you need to get saved with your heart, with your heart, it says, uh, a man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. What's that? The one you have in your heart now. Yes, sir. If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, not your sins, the Lord Jesus, yes, and believe in thy heart how that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Do you believe in your heart that Christ died for your sins? Do you believe that? That he died for your sins? And, and would you like to get saved? Lord, I'm a sinner with your heart, and I receive Christ as my Savior. Can you say that with your heart? And if you're not saved today, Lord, I, uh, I'm a sinner. You know your sin? I'm a sinner, and I receive Christ as my Savior. I need him. Would you say that with your heart if you're not saved? You need to be born again. Is there anybody that just said that? Just said in their heart, Lord, I'm a sinner, and I receive, we have one. Uh, I'm not embarrassing you or anything. You just got said, believe me, everybody in here is happy. Amen. That's right. Everybody Amen. in here is like a hallelujah, hallelujah. time. Hallelujah. If you need to get saved, you need to get saved, Lord, that's me. Christ died for me. I'm a sinner, and Christ died on the cross for me. Uh, that's how you get saved. That's how you get saved. Be my Savior, Lord. 
with your heart, not with your mouth, with your heart. It'll come out of your mouth sooner or later. Don't worry. That's the good thing about getting saved. Amen. And that's the Word of God. Let's, uh, let me pray with that. Father, thank you for this time, and thank you, Lord, for the Word of God. Uh, thank you for one soul uh, uh, making that public profession of uh, getting saved, Lord Father. I just ask you, Lord God, if you would, uh, would you bless our time, bless the, uh, the service to come, and we just ask you, Lord, to uh, bless us as we're here. We love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. Amen. Take that. Amen.
visitor at Brian's house. <laughs> Amen. So, um, but uh, it's good to see everybody. It's good to have a nice crowd. We have a missionary this uh, today, and that's a uh, missionary to India, and that is uh, uh, Brother Corey. He'll be in a few minutes. Um, Amen. <laughs> Amen. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of you, you know, most people do know me. Have been coming around and everything, either that or I think I, when I preach that your family's uh, at your your grandfather, your grandfather's funeral. Ninety ninety nine years old, the guy gets saved. Amen. Amen. Positive. There you go. No, ninety nine years old. Know what that means? Not too late. 
Never too late. Amen. Never too late. That's right. As long as you breathe, you get saved. Come on. Amen. You know, and uh, and don't take it too lightly. He says, redeem the time. Amen. And grab hold of eternal life. We don't enjoy being saved. Right. We enjoy everything in the world. We never enjoy being saved. Come on. Enjoy being saved. Look at you got. Where else? We only met. There's nobody here I met right now. Uh, Without Jesus Christ being in it. Yep. That's right. Amen. Yep. All right. We have no relationship without Christ. That's right. Amen. Okay. If, 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 if it wasn't, I wouldn't be in Governor. I will tell you that right now. I would not have been in Governor. The Lord told me to come here. I came here. Uh, you know, and at first I didn't want to come here. Come on. That's right. <laughs> but now I, I never want to leave. I never want to leave. So, uh... You know, people have said, you know, you could be a big preacher because of military and outside of a military place and an installation and all that. I'd, I'll be a governor. Amen. I only need 12 people and teaching the Bible. That's all I care about. Okay, so, uh, uh, brother, you want to do some hymns and get some people singing and and, uh, and have, the, have the Lord smile. Okay, we need a hymn. All right. The Bible says make a joyful noise, amen. It doesn't say make a professional noise, so uh, let's, let's all stand together and we'll make a joyful noise unto the Lord. Amen? Now listen, if you can sing professionally or you know you think you're professional, then knock it out amen? and sing louder than me. Amen. Number 97, song number 97. Hey, we've already had one come to know the Lord this morning. Yeah, we had one today. Listen, what a, what a blessing that is. And the reason that is, is it's not because it's not because of us, it's because Jesus saves. Amen? Amen. So let's sing Jesus saves. Amen. Let's sing it like we mean it. <laughs> He said he's going to go India style on us and go for three hours. So. Nothing but the blood. Hey, if you're saved here this morning, it's not because you did anything for it. 
Because he did everything for it. He spilt his blood. Amen. He gave his life. He died. He was buried. He rose again. Amen. And that's how we're saved this morning. Nothing but the blood. Amen. Okay. Don't look like you've had the blood of Jesus upon you. You look like you just rolled out of bed on, and not now. only stubbed one toe, but you stubbed two toes. <laughs> Come on, man. How can you not be happy singing about the blood of Jesus? Hell. Amen. I was smiling. Amen. If you're saved here this morning, you're not dying and going to hell. Amen. 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 You're going to heaven for all eternity. And it's Amen. because of this blood that we're yeah. singing about. Amen. Amen. So smile. Be happy about it. Amen. Amen. Hey, hey listen. If, if, if you are lost here, then you should be frowning. Amen. But I got good news for you. You don't have to leave here lost. That's right. We have a Bible and we can show you from God's Word, not ours, but from God's Word how the, this blood was spilled for you. Amen. Amen. And you can leave here smiling. Amen. So the next time you sing this song, you can smile all the way through, amen? amen? Nothing but the blood. Let's pick this up with verse 2 here. Think about it. Think about what you're singing about, amen? Hey, you were lost. You were dying. You were going to hell amen. until this blood got applied to you, amen? I'm not going to hell. Woo! Let's sing about it this morning. All right. Number 2, ready? For my part in this I see, nothing but the blood of Jesus, for my Shake some hands this morning, amen. amen. There's some new people amen. here. Amen. Let's just shake some hands and tell people how glad you are to see them, amen. Amen, amen. It's good to be here. 
house of the Lord, amen. See everybody in fellowship, man. You're talking, amen. We'll go ahead and have everybody uh, be seated if you want. Be seated as you make your way back. Um, so, uh, this morning, if you haven't figured it out already, we do have the baptism, amen. So, uh, praise God for that. It's good to see. Uh, it's good to see young people getting saved, amen. Yes, it is. Amen. It's good to see anybody getting saved. Amen. Amen. Listen, there's there's churches that go for weeks, that go for months. I mean, literally, uh, we, we've seen churches go years without getting anybody saved. Amen. And hey, it's not the church that saves them. It's Christ that saves them. But it's our job as a church to get that message out. Amen. Amen. We're privileged to have that, to have that uh, task. Amen. So um, we're going to have um, the girls come up and sing a couple of songs this morning. Um, they're going to sing a couple of songs, uh, and then also um, we're going to have uh, Brother Chartier's daughter is going to sing for us this morning. Amen. Amen. So um, they're going to sing some songs, and uh, Spirit will hopefully use them to, to get us even more uh, even more in tune with Him. So uh, just, just sit back and, you know, um, think about what they're singing about, amen? amen? Thinking about the words of what they're singing about, because, you know, they want to honor and glorify Him this morning, so let's, uh, let's do that, amen?
Amen. Lots of jumping in the water. Amen. It's good to be saved. Amen. All right. Uh, why don't we? Uh, why don't we take up an offering, if you would? And, uh, and then I'm going to start with the missionary. I may make some good jokes about him. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Uh, you want to, brother? Brother Wendell, would you pray, please? Our gracious Heavenly Father, Lord God, it's been good to be in your house this morning, Lord. And we just want to praise you and thank you for what you've done already. Lord, I pray that you help us now as, uh, Lord, we get ready to uh, take this offering, Lord. And I pray that uh, we would not only give of our finances, Lord, but um, I pray that, Lord, you just help us to be a people that we truly give of our time, our talents, our abilities, Lord. Help us to be uh, a serving people for you. Lord, help us to put uh, you and others uh, for ourselves. And Lord, may you be honored and glorified by what's done here tonight, uh, this morning rather. And I pray that you feel Brother Corey from on high, Lord. Anoint him with fresh oil from the Holy Spirit, Lord. Just give him power, give him unction, give him boldness, compassion. And help us to hear and apply, Lord, what you want uh, through your word and through the Holy Spirit. We just thank you for all this in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 said today we have missionary in he came from india uh he uh he served in the military for 21 uh 20 active 24 if you count the reserve time okay so it's 20 years yeah. good enough all right <laughs> he was a master sergeant in the army he's a bronze star winner uh with valor no bronze star winner he's got two purple hearts right yeah. two purple hearts been blown up about five times yeah. And he still keeps going. It's funny because when he, uh, they wanted a recommendation for him uh, when he was going to be a, a missionary, and somebody had called me up and they said, Do you think he'll make it? <laughs> <laughs> I was like, you got to be kidding me. Come on. The guy's been blown up so many times. I mean, he's still coming back, which really caught me because, yeah, I, I got the blown up thing too. But I was smart enough not to go back for another. <laughs> this guy goes back five times like he's getting tickets <laughs> to go in there. Does anybody want to get blown up today? And he's like, yeah, I'll do it. You know? <laughs> he was uh, EOD. That's what he did for a, a job in the military. He was a, a ordinance guy. But um, he's uh, when he started, he got called to be a missionary. Uh, and we started up here uh, just after that, and um, he was uh, he was one of the first people we supported. He yeah. got in right on. I think we were his first church. I he we brought him in, and um, he preaches one time, and everybody's like, "Oh, I like him, I like him," and I was like, "Okay." So we started supporting him in his his mission right there, and um, and he's been through it. And I'm not talking about with the mission field. I'm 
talking about with the brethren. Yeah, come on. You know? Yeah. You always know when something's going, when you got something and you're doing and you're in God's will. Why? The brethren don't like it. Right. Come on. My worst enemies are the Christians. Yeah, come on. You say, why? The ones that don't like me. I'm like, look, we're on the same team. Yeah. You know, they don't realize we're on the same team. Hey, look, you know, people are getting saved. That's what we're supposed to do, right? right? Amen. Get them saved, get families re reconnected to the Lord. Uh, uh, you got kids that are growing up, you know, you need that guidance. You need stability uh, through the Word of God. And uh, you know what you know what it is? Everybody wants to be, I call it church attainment. Yeah. You want to be entertained, and now they got the rock groups. And if your church looks like a rock concert, that's what you got. Yep. It's not a church. Come it's on. a rock concert. Jesus said, I'll build my church. Look, they got rid of the hymnal. You know what they did? This has been in the church for how many years? With the Word of God. Right. It's You don't catch it. This is how stupid people are. And don't get me wrong. I'm not telling you stupid, but I'm just saying. This is how It's a hymnal. What's it about? It's about Him. Come on. Amen. A hymnal. You ever read the words of this? Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. These people were spiritual writing these songs. You go back, they're spiritual. Amen. You know what the songs are today? Bum, 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 bum. Bum, bum. Come on. They're not spiritual. They're carnal. Amen. Our forefathers, they knew how to write music and they knew how to... They know how to sing. I mean, I look back, the guy who I basically took over from years ago was a man by the name of Bob Taylor. He was the last guy in this town that really preached the gospel. And when we came into town, we asked every preacher in this town what were the gospel was. You know how many gave us a good answer? No. They didn't know it. What happened? Well, the big thing that happened was they got away from the Word of God. Right. And that's the book. Yep. The Word of God, which is the book. There's there's 15, 20, 30, 40 Bibles. Go to a Christian store. There's 40 Bibles. They're not all the same. Nope. They don't say all the same. Right. I'll prove it to you any day. They don't say it. One is, and the rest aren't. You have to realize, but God has to be the one that shows you. It says in the Bible, Thy word is settled in heaven, O Lord. And it's brought down. You keep thinking... Vertical, I mean horizontal, timeline. You know how God thinks? Vertical. Right. The bread of life which came down from heaven, Jesus said, no man hath ascended up, but the Son of Man who descended. And he said, I'm going back up there. Everything God says, he says, you get it from above. Inspiration, where? From above. Inspire. The only thing you have to offer is iniquity. What's that? That's your thing. Right. Iniquity. In. Inhale, exhale. The English language is beautiful. It has everything descriptive for you. Uh, history. Do you get what the history is? History. There's a history called that Bible. And that's the perfect history that, that's out there. They go by it when archaeologists want to prove something. They go by it. If you're an honest skeptic, it'll prove it's 100% accurate. Yeah. Didn't you pick up on it? His story. His <coughs> story. Him, no. His story. Beautiful language. It's a beautiful language, Amen. and God knows exactly what he's doing, and he brought it to the English-speaking people, and it's here now, and it's that beautiful. Don't, don't, ever, don't ever, you know, it's just a beautiful thing. So uh, I'm done with my sermon, and uh, I hope if anybody needs to get saved, somebody gets saved today. Um, but, but brother, would you come up? Like I said, he's, he's my best friend. And we work out together, we serve together, and... Uh, Good friend of mine. Thank you. You have liberty. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah. That uh, when you you saying uh, I have liberty just always reminded me of my first two trips to India. They'd always tell me just before I spoke, take your time. And uh, for my first two two trips to India, I thought that they literally meant that I could take as long as I wanted. <laughs> I had no idea. But what they literally meant is, this is your allotted time, take it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> but uh, I'll try not to uh, go too far over today. I can't make any promises. Uh, I am used to India where uh, we only do one service uh, on, uh, on Sunday in our church, but it lasts uh, three and a half hours usually or more. Uh, so 
<laughs> Man, Americans can't listen over 15 minutes. <laughs> so, you know, but we're doing everything in three languages, Nepali, English, and deaf. Sign language. Sign language, yeah, sign language. Right, so when you do everything that way, it does make things last a little bit longer, too. Uh, let me know when you're ready. We're going to sing a, a song. This is my daughter, Christina. Amen. My wife stayed in India. We're used to spending sometimes months apart. So we decided that we'll, if we can avoid it, we're never going to both leave India at the same time. That way we can always be there assisting in the ministry and providing for the, the people there. Come on. Sorry. And we're going to be singing a uh, Nepali song. I'm going to be signing because those of you that attend this church that have heard me sing know that you don't want me sing. Uh, to hear me, so I'll be signing, and she will be uh, singing in Nepali. The song is Jaya Hos Yeshu Rajako. That was close.
Amen. Amen. Thank you. Uh, so I was signing an ISL, Indian Sign Language. I know most of the song, there's a couple parts I get messed up on, so there was some gaps in there. I know no one here knows ISL, so you couldn't necessarily tell fully, but, uh, but the overall meaning of the song is uh, Christ is our Lord uh, and King and Savior, Amen. and He died for our sins. Amen. Amen. Uh, uh, I'll, I'll just introduce what you do, and then you can sit down, that way you don't have to get back up. I'm going to talk about the ministry a little bit, uh, and just let you know what we're doing, the things that are going on. Uh, Christina, uh, as far as right now, uh, and I, I think she will stay stay with this, is she has decided to uh, go back to India with me. She's turning 18, but she feels that the Lord is calling her to continue to serve in India. Uh, for as far as uh, the ministry there, her main thing is uh, working uh, with the children. Amen. In India, they have a thing they call tuition. We would call it tutoring. And almost every kid in India doesn't just go to school. They also get tutored in some way if they can. Because uh, education is such a focus there. So what we do at our church is we offer free tuition. And uh, all the local Hindu and uh, Buddhist kids uh, from the neighborhood where our church is come uh, to tuition. And they get uh, from uh, Miss Smyrna, they get science, right? Science and math. Science and math. And then from Christina, she, she does uh, spoken English. And she helps them with their English. Amen. And uh, we, we actually got certified in English as a second language before we left the States in case the opportunity arrived to teach the children. And in that, she also influences them. We can't openly uh, lead uh, Indians to salvation as Americans in India. We will get removed from the country if we get caught doing that, so we find other ways. So in her tuition class, she uses that to make references to the Bible, and then also she shows up every once in a while for Sunday school hour with those same children, and she lets them know, now I'm going to be looking for you in Sunday school. And so they come to Sunday school, and Miss Smyrna gives them the uh, gospel in the Sunday school time period also. So uh, that's uh, how she helps out in the ministry. She also helps out in our uh, daily devotions and stuff with the uh, the deaf sewing class. So she sits there with them, and so she helps them through sign to understand uh, different parts of the uh, discipleship that we're doing there. And so that's uh, her part in the ministry. And anything I missed? Oh, and she leads singing for the for the youth group. Amen. 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 Uh, we sing in youth group. We concentrate on singing the uh, psalms. We different psalms that we learned here in America. We sing with the youth, and she plays the guitar for that. Amen. Uh, now, as far as me and Carrie, Carrie is currently teaching English to uh, some college students, but we've decided to kind of back off from uh, that ministry. Uh, some of that has to do with some of the stuff kind of your pastor talked about. You always have people that want to attack you, and just it seems like with that ministry, anything we do, even though they say they want our help, we come under some type of a, attack, and we're like, you know, we don't want to cause them any problems, so we feel it's best that we'll just stay in, in the neighborhood where our church is and continue working with our church, and we'll pray that they lead more, more people to the Lord and Amen. continue doing their work. Amen. Uh, and uh, that being said, uh, next... Uh, here in November, she will start doing the same thing Christina is doing, but amongst the uh, the women of our neighborhood. Uh, there's a great desire in India to know English, because if you, if you ever need a good job, you have to know English in India. If you don't know English, you, you will never get a good job. Yeah. And uh, so she's going to be helping in that part of the ministry, and she already spends uh, a minimum one day of the week uh, teaching the deaf how to crochet. So they're learning how to make blankets and, and different things. Uh, oh, I didn't bring that purse up with me. And they also, we have a sewing ministry, which uh, neither one of us are really good at sewing. Miss Mala, the pastor's wife, teaches them how to sew. And they sew, sew dresses, Indian garments, and uh, a lot of purses and bags. And uh, so I, I brought some with me to uh, present to the pastor's wives. 
just so they have something, even uh, they can use it for whatever they want to use it for, just so they have something that when they look at it reminds them of uh, the ministry there in India. So if you could come forward. Okay. So uh, this is uh, from the Himalayan uh, Deaf Ministries, yeah. and the yeah. deaf ladies make these purses and yeah. um, bags, and so we, we just want to give one to each of our supporting churches to the to the uh, pastor's wives and, and say thank you for all that you, the support especially Thanks. that you have given my wife. And they did that call to see what I was wearing today. <laughs> <laughs> I know I'm really nice. I'm ironic. <laughs> but uh, it's, it's, it's wonderful to work with the deaf. I, I, I had no plans originally on working with the deaf. I, I was originally going to be at that college and some things just came about that just the Lord really showed me that wasn't what he would have me do. I wasn't going to work in the college. I was just going to be associated with them and help plant some churches. And uh, I met Pastor Bimmel, my, my uh, home church in India's pastor. Uh, and on my first trip, and he never once asked me to just give him money. And, and that really changed my perspective because... Anybody that's ever traveled for missions, you can't walk into a church in a third world country as with white skin and not have them ask you for money. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, it's almost impossible. And uh, the only time he even ever mentioned money to me is he called me up when he knew because he knew I was moving there and his, he was having a hard time making the church bills. So he called me up and asked me to, if I wanted to buy his motorcycle so that I'd have transportation when I arrived in India. And so uh, I bought the motorcycle from him, and uh, I think that was the very same week that I decided, you know, I'm I'm moving over. I'm gonna I'm gonna partner up with Pastor Bill, and I still ride that motorcycle. That's my main transportation for me by myself. If I'm going anywhere fast in India, you can't get there in a car fast. Uh, and he has a heart for the deaf. And at first, I was like, you know. Okay, yeah, I'm part of this church, so I'm going to learn sign language. Mm -hmm. Sign languages came much faster than Nepali. I'm, I'm, I'm not even good at speaking English, <laughs> so it's really hard for me to speak another language. I, I'm, I'm not good at getting the right pronunciation, pronunciations, but I don't pronounce anything with my hands. You know, it's, it's a little bit more straightforward. And uh, and the deaf. Uh, sewing ministry and the, and, and the deaf that come to our church, you, they just, it just, when you start hearing their stories, it just breaks your heart. Uh, my first week there, I was talking to Jalpana. She's probably around the same age as me. A little tiny girl. I mean, she's like, what, maybe that tall? And uh, she was uh, talking to me about what it's like to be deaf in India. Uh, and I never really thought about it, you know. Uh, in America, we do things for people that have disability. You know, we provide them with things. We provide, you know, visual aids to, that let you know when to cross the street. Or if you're you're blind, there's most cities now have the one that makes the sound, so you know when you can cross the street. You know, we we provide them different. Uh, Things in their homes, you know, uh, my daughter knows a lady that's deaf in Watertown that she used to go and, and do work for, and when you ring her doorbell, lights flash, you know, things like that, just little things. And we have a much ordered society in general, so it's a little easier. Mm -hmm. Well, in India, there's no order to anything. Uh, you got cows in the street, you got dogs in the street, you know, no, they communicate by honking their horn if they're driving. So if you're walking and you hear a honk, 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 that you hear him honk, you look and you move out of the way. Well, if you're deaf, you can't do that. So she said, you know, when she first started trying to venture out of the house and come to the ministry, she was just scared all the time. Because you don't know if there's a car behind you, you don't know if dogs are running up behind you trying to bite you, you don't know if, you know, a, a bull lost a fight with another bull and is running through the street. You can't tell any of these things. So she was just scared all the time. But over time, even, even before she got saved, the Lord gave her a, a comfort in coming there. You know, he provided her a feeling of, if nothing else, safety and security in coming to the ministry. 
and coming to see Pastor Bimmel and, and Mala. And uh, that, that really touched me, you know, about how bad it would be to be in such a chaotic environment and not be able to hear it. <clears throat> and then you got uh, added on to that, you have uh, the ones that have a Hindu family. If you're Hindu and you're born with a defect, it's because you deserve it. So I'm not going to do anything if I'm Hindu to help you. Because you're paying the price for all those past lives where you didn't live right. You know, that's the mentality. So their society has no emphasis on helping people. They still have nothing. No one takes care of widows. Because their society was, was built for the wife to be burned on the prior with the husband. So ministries in, that, that help these kind of people is really what they need. And they're ready and willing to come. Now, there was still it's still hard to reach them. I'm not saying that's easy. I was just sharing with your pastor. We had five saved uh, a few weeks before I came. And uh, two of them had been being witnessed to for over seven years mm. before they understood and got saved. Seven, over seven years of sitting in a ministry, mm. and they just couldn't, couldn't get to that point where they understood. We made some breakthroughs when we started doing discipleship. When you increase the Word of God right. in the church, things happen. Amen. Amen. You know, God took care of us and blessed us when we started that discipleship program. Uh, the other parts of our ministry is uh, I travel and I, and, and I help church plants. And, uh, and the goal is when we get a young man trained up that for a minimum of a few months, whenever they plant a church, I'll go with them and I'll help them get it off the ground. But we want to make sure the doctrine is correct. So we're only sending people out of our own church. Uh, many of the ministries there have made partnerships and have sent people from all over the place. Mm -hmm. I ran into a guy that claims he's independent fundamental Baptist. And uh, he said, oh, brother, we, did, we, just, we just got 12 missionaries sent. I'm like, wow, that's great, you know, is my response at first. And then I said, well, how would you manage that? Well, the local association of here uh, said that they would, uh, they would send 12 missionaries. Mm -hmm. Well, what's their doctrine? If they're not preaching the word of God, it doesn't do us any good. Right. Amen. True. You know, that, and that that that's as Baptists, right? I don't even necessarily like the term independent fundamental Baptist. I, I, I'm a biblical Baptist. That's Amen. what my church says. Which means if the Bible says it, that's what we do. Amen. Amen. And in the Bible, churches produce churches. So it doesn't matter if they've been to college or anything else. What we're looking for is is men that we can bring out and plant churches that believe the Bible. Amen. And so that's that's the, the focus for me and Pastor Bimmel, other than the death, is planting churches where people are, are biblical, which means your church is separated. No one tells this church how to do service. Amen. Right, amen. That's right. Because this church is the local church. And that's how it's meant to be. You know, it's good to see so many people here in a local church. Uh, you know, when I first came here, I think the first time you ever had me preach, Pastor, uh, I think there was, what, seven of us that morning? You know, so it's good to see that, you know, there, there's, there's more people. And that was with my family, you know. That was before some of my kids went off and married people. You know, I mean, it was a, it was a small service, you know. And uh, it's good to see the Lord is, is working here in Governor. Uh, I'm going to get to the, the message now, but I wanted you to understand, you know, what we're doing there in India. I, normally, uh, if I was in a church for the first time, I would share a little bit more about my calling, but I know many people here have heard that several times, so uh, I just wanted you to know what we're doing on the mission field, and then I want to get to the Word of God. Uh, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 today, and uh you here in Acts chapter 2, we're going to start in verse 14, and uh, the title of the sermon that harkens back to uh, my young NCO days in the army before they started changing everything, and, uh, and on the front of our leadership manual, there was three words, be, no, do. Yeah, yeah no, in there. 
you can follow that same God. That's a God, like a God given pattern. That's a, that's how we're supposed to be as Christians. And uh, uh, here in Acts chapter two, we'll start by reading verses fourteen through twenty one, and then we'll uh, pray and get started. But Peter, standing up with the eleven, lifted up his voice and said unto them, Ye men of Judah, and all ye that dwell at Jerusalem, be this known unto you, and hearken to my words. For these are not drunken as ye suppose, seeing it is but the third hour of the day. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass, in the last day, saith God, I will pour out of my spirit upon all flesh, and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. And your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And on my servants and on my handmaids I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapor of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before the great and notable day of the Lord come. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Amen. Dear Lord, we come to you in prayer and we ask that you would just make your word apparent to us, Lord. Uh, just uh, provide a understanding, a, a supernatural understanding of your word. Lord, I know that each of us coming here has our own baggage and our own problems, Lord, but let us put those aside and be prepared in our heart and our mind to just hear your word and allow the spirit to do a work in our lives. Lord, we pray that you would just keep us settled in you and keep us focused on your word this hour, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen. See, here you have, uh, in Acts chapter 2, you have Peter. And it's interesting to me how God used Peter. Uh, most of us, uh, I think, can uh, when we look at Peter's life, we can kind of... A, really associate ourselves to, to him in a way. I mean, uh, in reality, I think sometimes we're a little too hard on him and we, we, uh, we uh, don't give him enough credit. I don't think most of us live up to the standard that Peter managed to live up to. You know, but uh, he was the one that, that, you know, denied Christ and he had all these problems. But here in this scripture, we see uh, him being who he's supposed to be. Yeah, I know. He's willing to stand out. Uh, you know, there in verse 14, you know, it, it's a contrast to, to Peter's earlier failures. In John chapter, you don't need to turn to everything I say. If you want to take notes, just write them down. I use a lot of scripture, so I don't want to spend a lot of time flipping around. But in John chapter 13, verse 38, it says, Jesus answered him, Wilt thou lay down thy life for my sake? Verily, verily, I say unto thee, the cock shall not crow till thou hast denied me Rice. Then in, we, we look forward and in John chapter 18 verse 27 it says Peter then denied again and immediately the cock crew. This is that same man right. that denied Christ and now he's standing and proclaiming Christ. See we have to set the example for the other soldiers. Uh, so often I find even in, in, with myself that I have a problem being who I'm supposed to be. You know, because the flesh creeps back in and we stop being who we're supposed to be for Christ. You know, Peter here in, the, in those scriptures, he, he stands up. Not only willing to stand up, but stand up how God wanted. Uh, there also in John chapter 18, verse 10, it says, Then Simon Peter... Having a sword, drew it and smote the high priest's servant and cut off his right ear. The servant's name was Malchias. Then said Jesus unto Peter, Put up thy sword into the sheath. The cup which my father hath given me, shall I not drink it? You see, uh, here Peter, he was willing to stand up at that point, but he wasn't standing up how God wanted him to. You know, so often in my life, that's me. Mm -hmm. Come on. You know, I'm wanting to stand up for God, but I'm going to stand up and punch somebody in the mouth. Amen. That's not what God wants us to do. That's our flesh. That's right. 
But but we all still have that flesh. We have that battle with the flesh. We got to let the spirit win. Right, amen. You know, I for years of my life, I mean, clear until probably six years ago, that was my mentality. Mm -hmm. I mean, because I was raised that way. Yep. I'm the youngest of seven kids. You know, that's that one thing that gave me a benefit when I came in the military. I didn't think basic training was that hard. <laughs> I've been getting whipped every day of my life. <laughs> right, come on. <laughs> I mean, he wasn't doing anything to me that hadn't been done before. Amen. You know, and that, that, that was my mentality. I grew up backwoods in, in, the, in the very far northwestern part of the United States. I mean, most, a good portion of my childhood, we didn't even have electricity. If you wanted the cops to come, you were waiting hours. So you handled things yourselves. Right. And that's just, I mean, that was my mentality. So it was hard for me to realize, you know, when somebody offends God, the response isn't, to then attack. We have to pray for them. We have to accept that. We have to be and stand up how God would have us stand up. Which means we stand up and we give the word of God. We answer with the word of God. And that's why I ended up Baptist. I wasn't raised Baptist. But the first church I ever went into that actually answered me with the word of God was a Baptist church. So I ended up Baptist. But it wasn't because of Baptist, the name. It was because of the Bible. Amen. Amen. If they have the name in their church and they're not using the Bible, they're not Baptist. Amen. Right. Come on. You know, and I know some Baptists have removed the name Baptist from their, from their churches because of the reputation some Baptists have given us. Because we're based on the Bible. We've got to stand up how the Bible says. Peter shows willingness over and over again to do this. If you look at Acts chapter 5, verse 40 to 42, it says, And to him they, they agreed, and when they had called the apostles and beat them, they commanded them that they should not speak in the name of Jesus and let them go. And they departed from the presence of the council rejoicing that they were counted worthy to suffer shame for his name. And daily in the temple and in every house they, they ceased not to teach and preach Jesus Christ. So standing up became a part of his character. You know, so often, we don't even want to endure a harsh word, let alone a beating. Yeah, that's right. You know, when it comes to everything else, you know, we have that attitude that we'll all stand for anything, but then when some, we know somebody might not like it when we mention Christ, we just don't mention it. Mm -hmm. We just keep silent. We have to be willing to stand up. We have to be ready Back in our primary text there in verse 20. It says, The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and notable day of the Lord come. We have to be ready for that day. Every morning we should be preparing as if that's the day. Amen. Amen. Because we don't know when it is. That's right. I, I tell you the truth. I mean, I've sat where and listened to some preaching where, where they, they guess about when it's going to be and it doesn't offend me. But I don't concentrate on that because I know I don't know. Amen. Amen. So I concentrate on every day trying to be prepared for that day. He could do this because he was ready. He knew the Lord could come back any day, so he lived ready. You know, part of being ready is also understanding it's a sacrifice to be a leader. Yeah. Uh, Matthew chapter 8. Verse 19 to 22, it says, And a certain scribe came and said unto him, Master, I will follow thee whithersoever thou goest. And Jesus said unto him, The foxes have holes, and the birds of the air have nests, but the Son of Man hath not where to lay his head. And another of his disciples said unto him, Lord, suffer me first to go and bury my father. But Jesus said unto him, Follow me, and let the dead bury the dead. To us, that's pretty harsh. Yeah. But that's what it is. If we're supposed to be doing ministry, we have to do ministry. If we're supposed to be in our place on Sunday morning, we have to be in our place on Sunday morning. If we're supposed to be teaching the Sunday school, we should be teaching the Sunday school. We have to be willing to lead. And we have to be ready to sacrifice as leaders. Everybody here, with the exception of maybe the, the little boy asleep right there, has somebody that looks up to them. There's a child somewhere. 
There's a, you know, even if you don't have your own kids, you know, I've yeah. being the youngest of seven, I was an uncle for a long time. And I didn't realize how much they were looking up to me. Right. Come on. There's things I did when I was younger, even though I was already saved, that I regret more because of how it hurt my nieces and nephews than because of what it did to me. Yeah, I know. Because they followed that path because they seen their uncle Corey do. See, everybody here with leadership isn't about what you want to do. And it isn't even about being wanting to be a leader. Right. It's about realizing that you are and being ready to be that leader, which means being ready to make sacrifices in your life so you set the proper example for those around you. You know, and none of this does you any good, by the way, if you don't start out and being who you're supposed to be by being saved. Mm -hmm. There's a whole lot of people that try to fulfill all these things with never being saved. Mm -hmm. yeah. If you haven't accepted the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, you can't be a Christian. Amen. You can't. You're just doing it in your flesh so people think you're a good person. That's good for nothing. How about it? If you haven't accepted that Jesus Christ died on the cross for you, you can't be who you're supposed to be for the Lord. That's right. And he wants every one of you to be someone for him. You know, so often uh, people think that this is just for certain special people. I have a son amongst the Kuki tribe that uh, he uh, went home to the village that he was born in. He hadn't been there since he was nine. But because he had done some Bible college, they considered him a theologian. So they're like, well, we're going to go drink and party and stuff, even though we're, you know, even though they claim they're Christian. But we understand that you're not going to do that because you're a theologian. Mm. There's no special calling of a theologian. You're either Christian or you're not. If you're right. Christian, you need to behave like you're Christian. And the only way you're going to do that is by being saved so that the spirit that is then inside you, right, the, the spirit that is brought to life in you, the spirit of the Lord Jesus Christ, the Holy Spirit, strengthening you so that you can live the life you're supposed to live in Christ Jesus our Lord. Well, that's the only way you can be who you're supposed to be. But there's things you have to know. Here in uh, Acts chapter 2, starting in verse 22, it says... Ye men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, the man approved of God among you by miracles and wonders and signs which God did by him in the midst of you, as ye yourselves also know. Him being delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, ye have taken and by wicked hands have crucified and slain, whom God hath raised up, having loosed the pains of death, because it was not possible that he should be holden of it. For David speaketh concerning him, I foresaw the Lord always before my face, for he is on my right hand that I should not be moved. You see, you have to know some stuff. You know, it's great to be saved. But once you're saved, you need to know some stuff. So many people stop right there. I know you got saved this morning. Don't stop right there. Amen. Yes, at the moment you got saved, you, you, you have a place in heaven. You are eternally saved. You will never lose it. Amen. But we need to know some things. We need to know who Jesus is. Amen. You know, the gospel uh, in Luke chapter 3 verse 22 says, And the Holy Ghost descended in a bodily shape like a dove upon him, and a voice from heaven which said, Thou art my beloved Son, in thee I am well pleased. You know, uh, if I had any day in all of history, that I could be in one place, that would be it. The Trinity, witnessing the Trinity in action. Mm -hmm. The Father proclaiming His Son, the Spirit descending upon the Son. I mean, amazing. Now, Jesus Christ is the Son of God. He paid a price for us. He is also our Savior. 2 Timothy uh, chapter 1, verse 9 says, Who has saved us and called us with and a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given to the cross, so that our sins can send our sacrifice. We have to know who Jesus is. Know what, we also have to know what scripture had to say about Jesus. In Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, it says, Therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Then in Matthew chapter 1, verse 23, it says, Behold, a virgin shall be with child 
and shall bring forth a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted is God with us. It's very important that this Bible says virgin. Yeah. Yes, it is. A young girl is not the same thing. Right. right. Don't take away from the Word of God. Don't, don't take away from the holiness of our Savior. His birth alone was a miracle. I'm going to turn to Psalms chapter 22, verses 16 through 18. Psalms 22, verses 16 through 18. It says, For dogs have compassed me, the assembly of the wicked have enclosed me, they pierce my hands and feet, I may tell all my bones, they look and stare upon me. They part my garments among them and cast lots upon my vesture. What a description. Before it ever happened. Before it ever happened. The Bible very clearly tells us who Jesus Christ is even before He comes. Right. We just have to look for it. We have to let the Spirit that's in us, once we're saved, guide us in this book. See, if you're, if you're not saved, through the wisdom of man, this book never makes any sense. That's right. You'll never figure it out. So many people that I've talked to said, well, when I read the Bible, I just don't understand it. I said, that's because you're not saved. Right. Amen. You get saved, the Holy Spirit, you won't understand it all immediately. It's a work. Yes, it is. But the Holy Spirit will slowly explain these things to you. I am by no means the smartest man in this room. Your pastor can tell you. <laughs> but I can still read this book and, and, and understand what God has for me. Amen. Yeah. That's a miracle. Amen. Come on. Because there's people out there with doctorates in philosophy that couldn't tell you anything this yes, book says sir. and tell you the That's truth. Right. I tell you what, I get so fed up every once in a while I watch, and I don't know why I watch TV at all anymore. It just makes me angry. But... Every once in a while, I'll watch a special on the History Channel, and they'll call on an expert in the Bible. And he'll start saying something, I'm like, that is not what that says. That is not what that means. Come on. How'd you get to be an expert in the Bible? Well, because he took a class. Yeah. You can't learn what the Bible says in a class. The Holy Spirit teaches you what the Bible says. If you don't have it, you can't learn what it says. So you can't know who our Savior was and is. Amen. If we're told that he would be killed exactly how it happened, which was not a way when Psalms was written that they killed people. It wasn't a common occurrence. There are, de depending upon which Bible school scholar you ask, between 300 to 365 prophecies that Christ fulfilled. The difference is not how many scriptures have prophecy, but how much you break down the individual scriptures. So many people never learn how to read their Bible. Yeah. I know your pastor here knows how to read his Bible. If you if you are having a problem learning how to study your Bible, because because reading and studying aren't the same thing. I read my Bible every morning. Mm -hmm. But when I study my Bible, I go through a lot less of the Bible. Mm -hmm. You have to figure out you're you're going in deep into each scripture and you're using scriptures to prove scripture. It's a much more complicated process, but it's worth it. If you don't study your Bible and you don't know how, you need to sit down with somebody and learn how to study the Bible. We have to know that Jesus is Lord and Christ. Verse, uh, verses 32 through 36 in our primary text there, it says, This Jesus hath God raised up, whereof we all are witnesses. Therefore, being by the right hand of God, exalted, and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy Ghost, he has shed for forth this which ye now see here. For David is not ascended into heaven, but he saith himself, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou on my right hand, until I make thy foes thy footstool. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom ye have crucified, both Lord and Christ. You know, so often after we get saved, not only do we not learn the Word, but we don't accept Jesus Christ as our Lord. Yeah. 
Jesus Christ is supposed to be in charge of our life. So uh, so many of the bad decisions I made after I saved was because I, I, I didn't understand that concept. I was uh, just so independent. You know, and I, that's one of the, 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 the differences I think I really see between an Indian when they get saved and an American. Because their society is so structured on people being in charge and not thinking for yourself, they accept that lordship from, from, from Jesus Christ much more readily. When they understand that Jesus Christ wants them to do something, they kind of react a little better. But as, as an American Christian, we don't, want to, we don't want to accept that authority. We're so individual. And, and in some ways, it's great. In a lot of ways, it's what's made our nation great. But when it comes to the Lord, we have to realize, wait a minute, He's in charge. If I'm saved and, I, and I'm living for Christ, that means living for Him. He's my Lord. I want to do what He wants me to do. Which means... That brings me to my last point, the willingness to lead the way. We actually have to do it. Amen. We have to be something. We have to know some things, and then we have to do. Look in uh, our primary text in Acts chapter 2, verses 38 through 41, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are far off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received the word were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about three thousand souls. Amen. Amen. I mean, I can't imagine. I've never seen anything close to that. You know? In my lifetime. Yeah. Just being there and just seeing so many people come to the Lord. You know, we have to we have to teach so that people know. If we don't get up here and teach from this book, right. how are the people supposed to know? We have to do it. We have to do it in our homes. If you have children, you should be spending time with your children in the Word of God. Amen. You should be spending time explaining and teaching to them. The commands of our Lord. You know, the last command of our Lord in Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20. Matthew chapter 28, verses 18 through 20, it says, And Jesus came and spake unto them, saying, All power is given unto me in heaven and earth. Go ye therefore and teach teach right. all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the world. It's very important that that teach came before baptized. Yeah. They have to be taught. They have to understand who the Savior is and get saved. Right. Then they can be baptized. Right. I know you're... Uh, have a baptism today, and that's wonderful. We had two just before I left. You know, unlike in military service, teaching is the battlefield at many times in the ministry. Because people don't want to accept good teaching. Mm -hmm. I was that way for a long time. Your flesh fights you. This is spiritual warfare, and it rages in our flesh. We have to do this. We have to teach. First Timothy uh, chapter 1 Verse 2, it says, On to Timothy, my own son in faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I besought thee to abide still at Ephesus, when I went into Macedonia, that thou mightst charge some that they teach no other doctrine. You see, part of this teaching is staying in the doctrine and teaching only the doctrine. Amen. Uh, back in our primary text in verse 42 and 43, it says, And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship, and in breaking of bread and in prayers. And fear came upon every soul that they met, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. You see, they stayed steadfastly in that doctrine because they were taught the doctrine. You know, I know that uh, the doctrine is very important because without it, people won't be affected. There's only limited things. Do people get saved sometimes in a church where they're not correct on 100% of the doctrine, yes. 
but they'll never grow properly. The doctrine is important. You can't reproduce a church if your doctrine is wrong. That's how, how the world has gotten worse and worse when it comes to its Christianity. Right. It's because no one's staying to the doctrine. We have to continue together in the fight. Verses 44 through 47. And all that believed were together and had all things common and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. And they continued daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart. Praising God and having favor with all people, and the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. I think most churches in America, if I got up there and told them that we all were supposed to sell everything and, and try to help each other out, they'd kick me out on the street. <laughs> you know, I understand this was a different time. He's preparing them for persecution, but that's still supposed to be our mindset. Right. If you need something, I'm supposed to help. If I can. We're supposed to be the family of God. Come on. But so many Christians would rather help their unsaved brother who just got out of prison than help the person sitting next to him in the pew. Mm -hmm. Now I'm all for helping people who got out of prison, get out of jail, whatever. But if you're not treating the family of God the same way you're treating your family, you have a problem. You've got to be willing to stay in the doctrine and continue to fight together. Amen. If we don't treat each other right, we can't fight together. That's right. The reason why me and your pastor... We're able to get through difficult times together is because we were willing to fight together and we're willing to stand with each other. Even if one of us did something wrong, it wouldn't end the relationship. That's right. Because we're going to fight together to fix it. Amen. Amen. And that's the problem. Is so often when the fight comes, we don't want to stand side by side. In 1 Corinthians chapter 1, starting in verse 10, it says, Now I beseech you, brethren, by the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak the same thing, yeah. And that there be no division among you, but that you be perfectly joined together in the same mind and the same judgment. Yeah. If we don't pay attention to doctrine, we can't stand together. That's right. So we need to make this stand as a family and as Christians to be and know and do the things we have to do. Mm -hmm. In conclusion, here uh, we have to continue to work and be out on the front line is the point. So often we abandon the front line of service. You know, uh, many times pastors are going out and they're soul winning all by themselves. Many times they're arriving to church and they're the Sunday school teacher, they're the preacher, they're the song leader. They're doing everything by themselves. That's not how it's meant to be. It's right, amen. The, pas the pastor is given to your church as an under-shepherd. He's there to be studying the Word of God and teaching and guiding in the Word of God. Yeah. We need to be who we're supposed to be, which starts with being saved. Amen. If you're not saved today, mm -hmm. I ask that you would just truly examine your heart. And I know the pastor, as soon as I uh, step down, he's going to go a little bit more into detail on salvation. But you need to examine yourself and say, you know, is the Lord speaking to me through His Word today? Do I Am I saved? Can I do any of this? And then once you're saved, you have to know the Word of God and know who Jesus is. Amen. So that you can do what the Lord would have you do Amen. and stay in the doctrine. That's right. Let's close in prayer. Dear Lord, I just thank you for this time. I thank you for the ability to uh, just get into your Word and to preach and speak to these people. Lord, I pray that you would affect the hearts and minds of the people here in this church. That if anyone here under the sound of my voice isn't saved, that they would let their heart accept who you are and that you died for them, Lord. That they would come to an understanding that the Lord Jesus Christ is their Savior and desires them to be saved. Dear Lord, I ask that you would just strengthen each and every one of us in your word and allow us to be those soldiers for you on the front line. In Jesus' name, I pray. Amen. Good message. All right, uh, Julie, you want to get the kids ready? Yeah. Just give me a few minutes uh, while she gets the kids ready. Uh, something you brought up. You remember in John chapter 14, uh, they were asking him. Now, these guys have been traveling with Jesus for about three years. Went through things with them. And all of a sudden, Jesus turns around and he says, um, he says, and where I go, you know the way. 
And Thomas turns around and he says, what's the way? Now think about it. Three years he'd been with him. And he says, where's the way? But Jesus clarifies it. He doesn't turn around and say, hey, you stupid or whatever. You know, he turns around and he clarifies and he says, I am the way. Amen. Amen. I am the way. You notice how he didn't say, well, I'm one way. Right. There's another way over Go down the block, and if you tic-tac-toe three in a row or something like that, you got a way. I, I'm not trying to mess with somebody. What will happen is if somebody puts you to Christ, what it does is it will get you there. But you've got to take that step. Amen. You've got to, I am the way, one way. I am the truth, one truth. I am the life, one life. That's it. There's no other way. And he turns around and he, and he brings it up and he says that if uh, you would confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in thy heart, how that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. I mean, how simple it is. It's called the simple plan. Do you realize everything for God is simple? We've complicated the obvious. Right. We've paid people $80,000, you know, and all this other stuff. And he was talking about Bible scholars. Let me tell you something, people. These guys walk around calling themselves doctor. I'm doc. Look. God don't need any doctors. He's not sick. <laughs> you know, they're phonies. They got a PhD. You know what a PhD is? Post hole digger. That's about as good as it's for in the Bible. Just the Bible was written for a sixth grader. And if your preacher can't speak to you like, a, like as if down to the lowest level, get out of there. Amen. And if he's speaking in some other language that you don't understand, and you know what I mean, it goes through obbity bobbity boo 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 and all that other stuff. Dipping a new and tip or two, it's not the gospel. Come on, amen. <laughs> he could be saying anything, people. That's right. And you have no idea. I'm not like I said. I'm not trying to insult people, but I'm trying to get it clear. Up here, yep. Christ was simple. He walks around for three and a half years. Simple plan of salvation. I'm the way. I'm the way. He said. Why can't it be that simple? Why can't it be that simple? It is just that simple. God never spoke to me in some other language. And I'm Greek, believe me. I would love it to be the original Greek. Why? Because I'd be a superior. <laughs> yeah, come on. I speak Greek. I get guys in here. Do you know the Greek? Yeah, sure, come on. I do. You know, but I'm going to tell you something. I'm not getting up here and I'm not going to flash you with a lot of education. Right, come on. It's got to be simple. Okay. It's got to be simple. And you know what religion does? It, it can get you there. But in the end, take away your baptism. <laughs> you remember the speech, don't you, Adrian? Take away your baptism. This is what I said to her father. Take it away. Take away your certificate of confirmation. Right. Take it away. I said, take away everything you knew. And you're going to be standing before God. You know what I asked her father? What are you trusting in? You know what he said? Yeah. And that's when he received Christ. That's my question to you. What are you trusting? If you're not saved or you don't understand what being born again is, and you don't understand that being saved, and you only get saved once, people. Amen. When somebody turns around and says, well, you can lose your salvation, man, we'd be all chain smokers. Why? I wouldn't know if I lost it two minutes ago with my mind. I wake up every morning. I'm, I'm upset. Right, come on. I'm trying to help you out this morning. And you ever notice those preachers that say you can lose your salvation? They always say you can lose it. They never say they did. Right. <laughs> come on. I mean, Jimmy Swagger, he was out there having a good time in limos and everything else with prostitutes. He never, you never heard him one time say he lost his salvation. Yeah, how about it? What a sickness. If you're saved, it's God's love that saved you. It's the greatest thing there is. You Amen. cannot become out of that love of God. You can't leave the love of God. Amen. It's good to be saved. Amen. If you're not saved, listen, just receive the Lord. I'm a sinner. You can't admit that. You can't admit you're a sinner. Come on. I mean, let me let me open up your closet. We'll admit you will find out if you're a sinner. Right. Come on. Amen. You can't you can admit you're a sinner. You can get saved. How's that? Realizing that Christ died for you on the cross for your sins. He is that completeness. 
If you're a sinner and you want to get saved, it's just, just as easy as this. It doesn't even take a prayer. It takes your heart. Yes, amen. It takes your heart. Lord, with your heart. Lord, I'm a sinner, and I receive Christ as my Savior. Amen. So easy, a little kid can do it. Right. And that's what we have today. Uh, I've dealt with these children for a long time. They actually, i got to say this. I think they call me pastor more than most of the older people. <laughs> Even the littlest one, she, she calls me Papa. Sorry. <laughs> she was calling me Papa all the time. I made a lot of visits to their house. I watched... Uh, we hit a lot of times too. Huh? We hit a lot of times too. <laughs> first, I gotta tell you the one story. The first time Brian and Julie come to church. Now I've knocked on their doors about nine times, maybe even more. And uh, and they they come in and, and Julie, you are she wasn't saved, but she we 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 were she got saved that service. It was pretty big, and I, I baptized her. But this is hilarious. We get, Brian comes in, Brian sits up front. And all of a sudden, it's, the kids do the usual, you know, and I'm not, I have no problem with kids. Kids run around, I'm like, yeah, okay, good enough. I don't care, I don't care, they're kids. You know, suffer them little ones. Suffer, what's that mean? Put up with them. Put up with those kids. So anyway, all of a sudden, Brian's singing, and he has the hymn book, and he turns around, and he goes, boom! And he hits one of the kids, and I'm like, what are you doing? So, he turns around, can I do anything with the kids? I said, we have a, we, have, we do have like a Sunday, you know, a, a little nursery or some uh, Sunday uh, junior church. And he comes over and he goes, well, he brings his kids over. And this is what he says to me. He says, one of my kids get out of line, beat him. Oh. I said, well, that's good. I'm going to beat the kids in church. <laughs> but they're a good family. They're a good family. And uh, Brian did a good friend of mine. And, um, when I went through a lot of trials, there was men that come along, they try and, you ever see what it says in the Bible, uh, wolves in sheep clothing? Yeah. You don't know they're wolves, they're, they're disguised, they talk really nice. Right. They're very nice to you, and then all of a sudden they see their teeth afterwards. Don't worry about the wolves coming from the door, we see them a mile away. It's the one with the sheep clothing that comes and you worry about. When they came after me, and we did, it did happen, we had a guy visiting everybody, telling them stories about me and whatever. And just so you know, all the stories that nobody, uh, if they want to put me in my place, you can come down. I have no problem. No, that's no problem for me. I have no problem. Everybody's has. Everybody in this town has put me in their place. I haven't met anybody that, that has. But they all have. And, uh, but, you know, what I'm trying to say is, when they all came after me with their teeth, they went to people like Brian. And you know what Brian said? I got no time for them. Amen. He wasn't always at church, and he wasn't always among us, but he was always with us. Amen. Always with me. He was one of my friends. He stood up for me when everybody else wanted to throw me away. Brian was one of them stood up for me. And I put a lot of, we put a lot of time in the children, because you know, we love them. We love them. So who's first? Anyway, let me move this one up. This will be on YouTube, just so you know. Savior? Yeah. Did you receive the Lord Jesus Christ yeah. as a personal Savior? Yeah. Amen. By your uh, by your declaration and, and your and you uh, pronouncing that, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. 
down in the likeness of his death, and raised in the likeness of his resurrection. Yeah! Miss Pam, you were the one that led her to Christ, right? Hey man, come on out. This is the family here. This is Miss Pam, and she uh, she's the one that led her to Christ. Right here in Sunday school. Where's my uh, Where's the other one? It's a celebration, right? <laughs> Have you received the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior? Yes. By your admission and and by the authority of God, I baptize thee in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost, down in the likeness of his death, and raised up yeah. in the likeness of his resurrection. Yeah. Anybody else? Anybody else? Amen. Anybody just get saved, got saved? Uh, doesn't know? That have never been uh, look, this doesn't do anything. That's right. You ain't, I know that, you don't get the Holy Ghost because you jumped yourself in wood. That does not work. That's right. You got it the day you got saved. Don't let anybody take it away from you. Amen. Amen. It's good to be saved. Amen. All right. Uh, we have cake and um, we're going to pray real fast. Uh, God bless it. Uh, Father, thank you, Lord God, for this time. Thank you for those uh, children coming, coming forward, Lord God. Uh, thank you for the girl getting saved today, Lord Father. I uh, thank you, uh, uh, Lord God, for uh, the people coming out and the family coming out. And, and thank you, Lord God, for the food you provided. And we ask you, Lord, to bless it. And we love you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Yeah.